Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Luca. This is Gabriel. And we're engineers at Spotify. We're going to talk about how we migrated our Android code base to Bazel. As we heard a couple times today, Android builds are complex. And the Android migration was definitely challenging. So we're going to talk about the problems we had, how we resolved them, what the outcomes were, and what our learnings were. We're going to talk a bunch about Android-specific stuff, but hopefully there's also some general takeaways from this. So off to you, Gabriel. So uh, back in 2021, we had a bunch of apps on the Google Play Store. We had uh, Spotify Lite, which was sort of for uh, lower power devices, uh, Spotify for artists, and of course, uh, the Spotify Music app. We had uh, about 100 developers contributing uh, weekly uh, and uh, 2.6 million lines of code in our Android sort of monorepo where we hosted all of these applications. Uh, these were just Android apps, so no uh, iOS code, no web code, stuff like that. We also had a C++ repository that we consumed artifacts from uh, that we called Core, and that had about a million lines of code. And all of this Android code was built using uh, Gradle. So this had been working quite well in the past, but uh, we were starting to hit some limits. So configuration times were uh, on the rise. We had to maintain these uh, sort of project files to make sure that the IDE worked well. We had a custom remote execution solution, essentially just like a beefy machine that uh, developers uploaded their code to. The machine built it, and then uh, they downloaded the artifacts back to their local machines. And this was just one machine running in the cloud for all of our developers. And uh, we didn't have any shared infrastructure, essentially, across uh, different platforms. So the only shared stuff we had was in this uh, C++ core repository that I told you about before. And our lines of code uh, were growing faster than linearly. So uh, this meant we had to have a more uh, scalable solution, ideally one that uh, would uh, make sure that we could share some infrastructure between, between platforms uh, as well. So uh, this kicked off some, uh, some work in the company. And uh, we started looking into switching the, the build system across the clients. And we looked into uh, using mainly Buck and uh, Basil. But in the end, we settled for Basil. All right, so let's talk a bit about how we did the migration. We decided to do something a bit different, uh, a bit brave. So we built a sort of a build bridge so we could run Gradle and Basil at the same time. Uh, and uh, Gradle build invoked Basil. Uh, this way, we could iteratively, iteratively adopt Basil bottom up. And the implementation was pretty simple. So basically, during Gradle's configuration phase, we would run a Bazel build src main. And then the Gradle build would use ARs and jars uh, produced by this Bazel build. This obviously isn't ideal, because it's building more than it necessarily needs to. But in practice, we saw that this worked well enough for us. That's because most of our developers are working on a single app and because Bazel's caching works quite well. So this approach had a few advantages. One was that we got developers to use Bazel really quickly. We got to see what the issues were, how well it worked, what the missing features were, and we got to add these features one by one. We also got to see some performance improvements pretty quickly. And generally, there was less load on CI compared to other approaches where you'd run the legacy build system and Bazel in parallel for some time. But there was also a few disadvantages. One was that it's more com complicated to run two build systems. They both consume memory. The way they resolve dependencies is slightly different. And also, the interop between the two build systems isn't entirely simple. For some time, our IDE experience wasn't great. That was because developers needed to use one instance of the IDE to work on code that was built with Gradle and another one to work on the code that was built with Bazel. So we wanted to keep that to as short as possible. And lastly, it was hard to scientifically gauge the performance, because we never had like a, 
complete basal build and a complete cradle build, and we couldn't compare those. But as we were moving things to basal, we saw the performance improve, and we are confident with continuing. So this is how our migration progress looked like. Initially, it was quite slow. We were like testing the waters. We were seeing what features are missing and adding them. Then it's uh, sped up a bit. We decided to change the approach, and we scripted most of the conversion. And we started creating these big PRs, moving many Gradle modules into basal targets at the same time. So things really sped up then. And over a couple months, we migrated most of the code base. A big milestone for us was building the main app completed with Bazel, the debug app, that is. Because at that point, developers could do most of their daily workflow completely in Bazel and get that better performance. But we weren't done yet. We still needed to migrate the tests. And we needed to create the release versions of the apps. So more on that later. And a few months ago, we were finally done, and we were able to remove Gradle. Generally, this, um, this graph is like a good representation of the 80-20 rule. Like 80% of the progress was done in 20% of the time, or in other words, 20% of the work took quite a long time. So one of the things we needed to do was improve some things in, re regarding with performance. We saw that it wasn't always better than in Gradle out of the box. One of those things has to do, do with um, Kotlin compilation. We saw quite a lot of invalidation there. And to understand that, let's look at this example build graph. So we have four Kotlin targets that depend on each other. And let's look at the input of the Kotlin C action for target A. So by default, in rules Kotlin without any, any flags enabled, the inputs would include the sources of the target A and the jars produced by the, all the dependencies of the target A. This includes the direct dependencies and the transitive dependencies. The reason this isn't great is because if you change any of the code in any of the targets, you'd always need to recompile A. So the first improvement here is to use the experimental use ABI jars flag. So when this is enabled, the Kotlin C action depends on the ABI jars. So these are the interface jars, and they only include the interface of the targets. So now, if you change the implementation of one of these targets, the target A will no longer be rebuilt. So this worked quite well, and it works out of the box. We got about 30% improvement in practice. But creating the ABI jars uh, does take a little bit of time. The second improvement was more involved. It's uh, using the experimental prune transitive depths flags. And when you uh, flip this flag, the jars produced by the targets that our target transitively depends on will no longer be included as one of the inputs. But the flip side here is that our target would no longer compile if it actually uses code from one of these dependencies. So let's imagine that A uses something from D. In this example, we need to add that direct dependency on the target D. In other words, this requires strict dependencies. So, and when we do this, now if we change something in C, we no longer need to recompile A. So this seems pretty complicated for such a small thing, but in a big build graph, this does matter, because some of our targets could have uh, a couple thousands of um, reverse dependencies. So now let's talk about testing. We had a different issue here. Not that we had too many inputs, but that our outputs were quite large. So each Android local test can produce megabytes of outputs. And when you have thousands of these tests, that becomes an issue. So the way we resolved this was to create these Android local test suite rules. And those would uh, run the test for a few test cl classes. Um, so this maybe isn't the most basal things, uh, because according to the guidelines, 
every task class should have a separate target, but for us this worked quite well in practice. That's because um, all the task classes in a single package usually have pretty similar dependencies and get invalidated for similar changes. And developers also tend to run all the tests in a single package. We use snapshot tests quite extensively. So these are tests that render an image of the UI and compare it to a baseline to see if something inadvertently changed. We used to use a framework called SHOT, but we migrated to Roborazzi. That's because Roborazzi doesn't run on the Android emulator. It runs purely on the JVM. And with Roborazzi, it was also pretty simple to adopt Bazel. So here's a post by Ben that outlines how to do that. And we, when we did both of these changes, we saw the test times improved a lot. They used to take 18 minutes across a few CI jobs. And after that, they only took seven minutes. We also use Bazel diff. So Bazel diff was mentioned a couple of times today already. We have this sort of configuration language with which we can define what CI jobs should be run for a given change. Our colleague Patrick uh, made a talk about Bazel diff and how we use it uh, last year. So if you want to know more about that, uh, look up that talk. Bazel diff has some overhead, so your mileage might vary. It depends on what the overhead of your CI jobs is versus Bazel diff and how avoidable these jobs are. So uh, taking a step back in the timeline again, when uh, we were at the point where we were running most of our uh, local builds using uh, Bazel, or essentially all of them, uh, and almost all of our CI in uh, Bazel. The only thing that was left in Gradle was uh, optimized builds, so things like uh, release builds, canary builds. And we really wanted to stop uh, paying the cost of maintaining two build systems. And we wanted to profit because uh, Bazel is so much faster, right? So uh, we set out to uh, migrate those as well. But uh, there were some issues. So uh, we couldn't just adopt Bazel out of the box since the native Bazel Android rules, like the Java implementation, uh, had some missing uh, features that we required. And I want to preface this by saying that the Starlarkified rules Android uh, that we've heard about before today uh, were not in the state that they are now when we started out. So some of the things we had to implement uh, are actually already implemented in the Starlarkified rules. So to understand what we had to do, one needs to understand uh, a little bit about uh, an Android app. Uh, so an Android app or an APK that is the uh, file you produce, uh, is the Android package. So the APK is really what you install on your device from the Google Play Store. Uh, and then an app bundle or an AAB is what you upload to the Google Play Store. And then the Google Play Store will generate APKs based on that bundle. So there are some different files that you need to know about to understand what I'm going to talk about next. So in the APK, you can see that there are DEX files. And these uh, are really the code that is uh, executed on your Android device. And then there is a REST directory, which is the resource directory containing uh, resources that your uh, app needs. So things like images, fonts, uh, layout files, things like that. And then also the resources.arsc file, or the resource table, which maps from resource IDs into resources in the REST directory, or to uh, strings, which are just compiled into the resource table straight away. And uh, if you look at the uh, app bundle structure, you can see that it kind of resembles an APK as well. So we have the base top level directory, which is uh, sort of the base of your app. And then in this case, something called the dynamic player. Uh, but that is really something called a dynamic feature. So essentially, you take part of your app, split it out into a separate feature. And then only users that require that feature at runtime will download it. So essentially, your app size is uh, smaller for people who don't use all of the features. And um, the native Android rules had some support for uh, building Android apps, of course. Um, so the way you, you build an Android app is you compile Java or Kotlin code into class files. 
And then those class files are compiled into DEX files that I showed you before. And then that's put into the APK, right? But to make sure your app is nice and small, you do some code shrinking, some optimizations. And this used to be done with a tool called ProGuard. Uh, so essentially, that took the class files that you compiled from the Java and Kotlin code, ran some optimizations, and produced new class files. And then you would dex those new shrunk class files. But uh, on the Gradle side, uh, a new tool had been introduced called R8, which essentially merged the uh, optimization step and the dexing step into one. And the native Android rules did not support uh, R8. So there was a, an upstream PR by uh, someone called Maurizio. I don't know if you're here today, but if you are, shout out. Oh, you are? Nice. Uh, so we based our uh, R8 implementation off of that PR. Um, and that worked really well. Uh, so once we had that in our rules, we could produce uh, APKs that were kind of similar in size to what we did in Gradle. There was one thing missing, though and that was uh, uh, resource shrinking. So essentially, when you build an Android app, there might be resources that you don't actually use in code from, I don't know, libraries, or if you just forgot to remove them. So the resource uh, shrinker checks for references to these resources in the class files, and that just removes whatever resources are never actually referenced. And like I said, this happens, uh, or this checks the class, class files. But since we were now using R8, this no longer worked. But R8 has some libraries uh, for checking DEX files instead. So we had to patch the rules uh, again to make sure that the uh, resource shrinking was done against the DEX files instead of the class files. So at this point, we could produce APKs where the DEX files were nice and small. Uh, all of the unused resources were removed. But there was still one thing missing, and that was the app bundle support. So uh, this meant we were going on another adventure. There was some previous work done around this uh, by a company called Opia. They had uh, produced uh, some uh, rules for creating app bundles from APKs. But these rules relied heavily on shell script ex execution, which turned out to be problematic for us since uh, the macOS file system is case insensitive. So that meant when uh, you took the APK, you unzipped it to move files around. Uh, if there were two files with the same name but different capitalization, then only one of them would end up in the final zip file, which is the AAB at the end. So this meant we had a bunch of runtime crashes, and uh, that was no good. So what we did then instead was we re-implemented these rules in uh, Python, and that was great uh, for a couple of reasons. So one, we no longer had to write to disk, which was way faster since we could do all of the, the file uh, handling uh, as uh, strings in Python. We, of course, solved the case insensitive uh, issue, and then it made the rules more testable as well. Okay. So now we could produce app bundles, and they were nice and small, and they didn't contain any unused resources. But there was still one thing missing, uh, and that was dynamic feature support. So we couldn't produce those extra dynamic features that I showed you in the app bundle before, and the Opia, Opia rules didn't support this uh, either. So we had to implement this uh, from scratch. And that implementation could really be a talk in and of itself, because the, the way you build that uh, gets quite convoluted. But uh, I'll skip that for now and say we just did it. Um, yeah. So uh, once we had all that, the app was nice and small. The dynamic features were working well. We could finally release uh, an Android app uh, to our end users. So in May of 2024, uh, all of the Android Spotify apps were uh, built using Bazel. So let's talk a bit about the results we see. We can see the clearest results in CI. Our Gradle builds were slowly getting slower. And um, at some point, the median time for our pre-merge builds was about 45 minutes. But when we migrated those uh, slowest builds to Bazel, we saw a steep decline. Uh, 
and today the median time is about 20 minutes. We do run or we do build release apps in pre-merge to do things like app size checks, and those um, run R8, which Gabriel described earlier. So R8 is pretty slow and it's not really parallelizable and it takes 10 minutes. So considering 10, we're pretty happy with the uh, time of 20 minutes. But we didn't achieve that just by sharding the builds or by running them on remote execution. Um, in fact, our CI agent usage dropped a lot as we were moving stuff to Bazel. Uh, we used to consume maybe 15 hours of CI agent time per merge PR, and today this is five hours. What's also nice with this is that our code base is still growing, but this number isn't, so we, are, we think that we achieved a pretty scalable solution. But we didn't move to Bazel just to get better performance. We also moved to Bazel to have one build system for all our client developers. So with that, developers get one CLI, they get um, shared infrastructure so, such as remote cache, and we have one way to instrument the builds. We're also a bit fans of chromaticity that we've got and correctness. So now the setup is really simple. We need just a few tools like Git, Git LFS, and Basilisk. And after that, we can run any build in our repository. We also have way fewer issues with something um, being different locally and on CI or developers using wrong versions of SDKs or tools. We still have a bunch of future plans. So uh, we are not using remote execution yet for Android. We're using it quite extensively for iOS and C++ with good results. But when we tried to use it for Android out of the box, it didn't work well. So there was a talk earlier today about JVM monorepos. And we lear I learned all that we need to do. So. So that's great. Um, we're working towards a client monorepo. So that's one repository for all our clients, the Android web and iOS clients. And we think that'd be especially impactful because we have this big and active C++ code base that's shared between those. We want to um, improve caching, or especially cross-platform caching. So against Thanks to Janusz's talk, we, we know how to do that. We thought we were going to use cache key scrubbing, but that's maybe not the right idea. So we're going to look in universal tool chains. And finally, we're lagging behind a bit when it comes to using the latest and greatest. So we want to update to Bazel 8 and use rules Android. And with that, we want to um, use Bazel in a way that's closer to the rest of the community and upstream some of our changes. And on that positive note, let's move over to questions. Uh, so I'm curious, did the changes you made to get around limitations in the native rule, did you actually fork Bazel, or did, was this all done by Starlark? magic on top of whatever was there. Yeah, we did fork Bazel. We realized at some point that we can't wait for things to be merged into Bazel, and some of the things weren't being merged into Bazel. So we created a way to apply pa patches and build Bazel ourselves. And yeah, that was pretty needed. Uh, today we have something more than 20 patches, and most of them are related to Android. Some of them are related to Windows. We do hope that things are going to get better and simpler once we move to the Starlark rules Android and most of these patches are going to go away. Yeah, I hope so too. Thanks. So uh, we also tried to keep the uh, uh, like changes in Basel to a minimum. So with the dynamic features, for example, it did require some changes in Basel core or the native uh, Android rules. But uh, there was some Starlock rules that we had to write on top of that as well. Um, do you guys uh, did you guys talk to Google because they use Bazel internally to use their apps and they probably use R8 and App Bundle? So basically, you did the same thing but internally, and both of you are now closed source. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, 
we did talk to uh, Google in the uh, SIG meetings, uh, but if I understand correctly, Google are not really using dynamic features internally, right? Yes, okay. Uh, so that part was kind of the hardest part, and we were not really on our own because we could check the Android Gradle plugin uh, for uh, ideas. Um, but, uh, you know, there was some community help, for example, with the R8 uh, PR uh, as well. well oh, and the second question was, it's closed like, source, right? Yeah, so... Yes, uh, and it is, unfortunately. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, don't be a stranger. So, uh, if you want some ideas, we can uh, definitely talk. Yeah. Have uh, Spotify have done the same implementation with iOS also? If we did a similar implementation with iOS, yeah. do you mean like the way we did the migration? Sorry? Do you mean the way we did the migration? Yep. Yeah. No, we chose a different approach for basically all our other clients. So there we had the more traditional approach, I would say, of generating the build files, all of them, and running the, both of the builds uh, in CI for some time, and then kind of doing one big switch. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone.